Hello, Dazzine family. Today we're going to be discussing SIBO, uh, ways that I see it uh, present itself clinically, and also how I take care of it. So we're going to walk through what the condition is, how I diagnose it with various different tests, and then ultimately what we do to get rid of those bugs. All right, so SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Ideally, most of the microbiome is going to be situated in the colon, right? So the large intestine. And, you know, in some instances, the bacteria can migrate from the colon into the small intestine. They start fermenting carbohydrates and other non-digestible foodstuffs into various components, including gas. That gas leads to bloating, abdominal distension, and really interruptions with other microbiome uh, constituents that should be healthy and producing good effect. And then also kind of brings in this entire ecosystem of pathogens that can also be present. So it's not just overgrowth of commensal bacteria, which are considered good or bad depending on their concentration. But when you bring in the pathogenic aspects of it, it's more to the detriment of the host because not only is it just bacteria that's overgrown, but those bacteria also produce toxins and have other effects on the system as a whole that can lead to more severe symptoms. So how do we figure out what's going on? Well, initially someone will just present with abdominal distension or stomach pain or reflux or issues with constipation or diarrhea. They might look like IBS, it could look like Crohn's, it could look like you know, ulcerative colitis. And they could have a history of functional gastrointestinal diseases. So in those circumstances, after we do kind of the full blood workup, uh, making sure there's nothing systemically uh, abnormal, we can take a more unique and nuanced approach at the gastrointestinal system. So we can use breath testing, uh, which is kind of the gold standard for, for SIBO, looking at uh, methane production, looking at um, sulfur gas production, and also looking at um, hydrogen gas. Those are the three gases that typically get produced from the digestion of the different fiber sources, carbohydrates. After the gas test is done, or even before, if we want to do more of a stool-based analysis, we can do a stool test where you poop in a kit and send it off and they look at the different microbiome uh, constituents, not just from a functional perspective for health, but also to see, you know, is there a difference in how these guys are colonizing the small intestine and the colon in general? Because you really can't tell where they're coming from you just see that there's a large discrepancy in what the normal value should be and what they have. So someone gets a stool test, it comes back and it looks like there's SIBO present. That could look like pathogenic variant or it could look like non-pathogenic variants, right? So non-pathogenic variants are a little bit more difficult because you can't just attribute their symptoms to a bad guy, right? The bad guy in this case is just the overgrowth of quote unquote good bacteria that are now out competing and presenting a challenge for the rest of the, of the environment. When it comes to treating those kinds of cases, historically, you know, in the past, utilizing nutraceuticals has been effective, but typically not in the long term. So using things that will provide an antimicrobial benefit as well as a benefit to the GI system that needs recovery in general is helpful and sometimes will help reduce symptoms. But once they remove those interventions, the symptoms usually come back. So after a few years of kind of playing with, with SIBO and, and nutraceutical interventions, I kind of took a different approach and started really using heavier guns, being antimicrobials, from a pharmaceutical perspective, to augment the natural and nutraceutical antimicrobials as well. It's even more important on the side of the pathogenic variants of SIBO because those guys are causing problems in and of themselves, not related to their growth potential, right? So even if you have a few or one pathogen, um, whether it be a parasite or a virus or a protozoa or a worm, those will be a lot more abrasive and need to be cleared out quicker uh, and, and with more urgency than does the non-pathogenic variant of SIBO. The treatment course really, it takes a month, right? So to really nuke the intestines to kind of start over, utilize tools to uh, support the gut in that transition, and then repopulate it and repair it in the month afterwards, kind of constitutes our nuke and repair program, right? So the kill phase and the repair phase of a SIBO protocol um, is, is quite intensive, and it requires a lot of supporting players, right? From 
biotoxin binders to make sure that someone's not going to have a detoxification reaction from things dying off, um, making sure that all the nutritional pathways are supported, and, and ultimately making sure they tolerate all the supplements and the main pharmaceuticals that are going to be used in the program. When it comes to the repair side of that story, in the stool analysis, typically we'll get a ideas of secretory IgA, we'll look at their digestive enzymes, we get to look at if they're still fat or carbohydrate that's non-digested. We'll also get an understanding of immune reactivity to gluten and gliadin as a potential, as, as well as looking at the intestinal tight junction proteins, zonulin and occludin. And all of those really help facilitate the direction that we take in terms of how we treat a gastrointestinal problem that looks like SIBO, that may not be SIBO, but ultimately making sure that we replace and regenerate after getting rid of SIBO is the best way to make sure it doesn't come back. Last but not least, one of the underrated strategies in treating and maintaining a, a good gut after SIBO is physical manipulation of the intestines. There are a lot of theories kind of around intestinal strictures and connective tissue, scar tissue that can kind of choke the small intestines in, in ways that prevent the microbiome and the, and the different bacterial motility throughout the colon that can lead to the inefficient transmission through the small intestine into the colon. And when that happens, it leads to these pockets kind of building up where there are potential uh, environmental disturbances that lead to greater chances of SIBO. So when you can have a, a physical therapist or uh, a different manual therapist really get in there and move the intestines around and make sure that everything's flowing correctly, that can be really beneficial for someone who has a, a proclivity to keep getting SIBO or other small um, intestinal or even just broader spectrum gastrointestinal issues by mobilizing and making sure everything's flowing correctly.